Well, I, yeah. Um, before I got a guitar, we would always imitate. We would take uh, plot, <laughs> three quarter inch plywood and cut out guitars and make oh, that's cool. Them. Yeah. And uh, and play in the basement to the songs, you know, King songs, Beatles songs. Mm -hmm. This podcast is about you, your journey in music, and we'll talk about uh, the new record you have coming out. What city are you in? I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, very cool. Yeah, whereabouts are you? I'm in Portland, Oregon right now. Oh, I, wow. here now. <laughs> I'm, I just moved to Nashville about six months ago from, yeah. San, Di from San Diego, yeah. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, we what love it change. here. What a change. <laughs> yeah. I know, as I look outside, it's just pouring down rain from that hurricane. It's was coming through. That. Yeah, it's been, it was beautiful uh, up until yesterday. Now it's just right. downpouring, but it's different. We like well, it, though. It's nice. Yeah, you're getting the rain we should be getting out here in the Northwest. Yeah, are you guys aren't getting rain? Oh, we, it's been so dry for the last, uh, God, two or three years. We usually get a lot of rain in June. We didn't uh -huh. get any of that for the last couple of years. We're like way behind. That's why all the fires kick up. Oh, wow. The fires can, can, can kick up. Oh my gosh. I didn't realize that it was uh, so dry up there. But uh, yeah, we're getting hammered here. Yeah, <laughs> we got uh, a lot water. of water. <laughs> we've got forests all around us. Like downtown, you go downtown, right up the hill and behind the downtown is for, uh, National Forest. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere. I mean, our backyard, five, five minutes away is National Forest. Wow. And uh, so there's a lot of danger when everything dries out. Oh, yeah, with fires Things and everything, up, too, huh? Kick up and either lightning or uh, electrical or something uh, happens. Uh, we get, yeah, and they, there were quite a few of them in the last month or so. Mm -hmm. Your 60 little fires going out and making up a big, yeah. That's scary. Yeah, when we were in San Diego, they'd happen all the time. Actually, my yeah. wife's uh, parents' house, my in-law's house, yeah. burned down like in 08 oh, yeah. due to a oh, fire. Yeah, yeah with the that. forest fire. Yeah, it's. I mean, they rebuild. It's all good now, but it, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Those fires. Yeah, our, really our promoter, uh, he, uh, our um, uh, booking agent, his his house burned too. Yeah, he was trying to say he was in his pool throwing stuff in his pool. Trying, he had to get out of there because the smoke got him. That is crazy. But he, oh he survived. You know. That's good. Yeah. So wow. uh, yeah. Well, uh, more yeah, people, a... more climate change, more you know. <laughs> sure. Yeah, really you not. grew up uh, where? Detroit. Detroit, uh, yeah. Born and raised? Uh, I was born in Buffalo. We moved, uh, my mom wanted to get out of Buffalo. So we moved to uh, a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, moved to Florida for about five, six years. Uh, left there, went to Detroit. My mom's sister lived there. So we're in Detroit, you know, big burgeoning working class town. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. So okay. so, about how, nine, how... Eight, nine years old, eight, nine, okay. ten years old. Till uh, uh, I got a house here. My son was going to be born um, 97. I got a house around 97. So okay. I was going back and forth. Between Oregon and... and yeah, uh, just, uh, still get yeah, back Detroit, to Detroit. Detroit. Yeah. Oh, cool. My family's there. I still get back there uh, all these three or four times a year. That's nice. That's like nice. Spring, summer, winter, you know, the whole thing. Sure. Wow. Well, how did, how did you get into music? Were you into music prior to moving to Detroit from Florida? Oh, that's a long story. Um. My brothers, I think, uh, well, I always wanted to play piano when I was really little. We didn't have okay. a piano. We did once at one time before I was born and we had a piano. And uh, let's see, uh, I wanted to play piano, no piano. Uh, I loved the records. My, my brothers had rec uh, 45 singles mm -hmm. in the 50s. They were, they, were, they were teenagers in the 50s, 14 or 15 years old, 12 and 13, 14 years old in the, 19, in the mid to late 1950s. Mm -hmm. And so... And I was really little then, but we used to pull their records out and listen to the records. Like it was probably 1959, 60. And uh, we're three, four years, four years, five years old, whatever it is. Uh -huh. um, and listen to the records. Yeah. And then wow. we were in Detroit until about, we, we would go to, back and forth to Detroit to visit my uh, aunt and uncle, you know, over the years. And in mm -hmm. upstate New York, we'd go to upstate New York, but mainly Detroit to see my mom's sister. So we were there in the, in the late 50s and uh, early 60s, and then we moved back there. My brother passed away oh, uh, wow. in 60, 1962, I think it was. And, uh, and, it must um, have been hard. I'm sorry. Yeah, that was the big... After going from Buffalo with snow and 
deep snow four feet of snow and all that and to florida wahoo you know right fun son and then uh you know th that tragedy happened and um and uh we moved to detroit mm -hmm. and um i started grade school and uh uh, Motown was just coming up. Motown was just uh, uh, Smokey Robinson with um, "You Better Shop Around" is what I heard. Oh wow! And, okay. And uh, yeah, and and a lot of the like really early Beach Boys stuff, really his surf stuff was just coming in, mm -hmm. and a lot of frat music, frat frat rock, you know, like Louie Louie and all that stuff. Mm, sure. The okay. Sonics, yeah. the Sonics, and all that those kind of bands, and and then those Detroit was really made up of. Um, soul music not really the, the rock and roll was elvis pretty much elvis buddy holly you know mm. usual like around the country but then uh let's see uh motown uh, a lot of bands played soul music they're playing like uh playing uh james brown and uh james brown otis redding show tunes like show tunes with people working in um auto factories 24 hours a day right cars being made 24 hours a day you know uh for for auto automakers, four to six automakers and General Motors and all that, uh -huh. and uh, they were right down the street from our house. You know, my brother worked for him in 1965. He worked for Chrysler, and my mom worked for Ford for a little bit. And um, <laughs> everybody's family worked for you know. Yeah, uh, uncle of mine works at GM or worked for GM yeah, back then yeah, too. Yeah. yeah, it was huge. I mean, the city was uh, you know what uh, a few million, almost mm -hmm. two million, I think, in proper city proper, Detroit proper, and uh, big union town. Mm -hmm. uh, uh all walks of life colors of people uh nationalities we all work together mm -hmm. really together yeah and uh the music was a big outlet for the people that worked their ass off in the in the in the factory you know dirty grimy factory and not so much the factory but the air and the, right sure just the something that kind of tough and right kind of hard get, keep you going right yeah yeah that's it yeah and you know the little little bars around the little uh pubs and bars uh outside the factory lots and all that and mm -hmm. get your time off to go there and come back to work or whatever or after work they were working you know they worked all you know all late in the morning and uh i mean all 24 hours and um not far down the road from us uh it was a stamping plant and you could hear the stamping plant at night you know uh they were stamping out uh vendors you know, mm -hmm. hoods, that kind of thing. Oh, and, uh, wow, yeah. Yeah, bodies and stuff like that. Their stamping plant was not far away, uh, probably a mile and a half away. And we could hear it like the you know, outside when it's hot in the summer, you know, laying on the front grass and talking, whatever, hanging out. You could hear that. We, nice. we used to sleep on the porch. There was no air conditioning. So we'd oh, sleep wow. on the, if you had an apartment, you had an upstairs porch, you'd sleep uh -huh. on the porch on a cot or something. It'd be really hot. And you could hear the, that whole thing you could smell oh, a little man. bit of it oh wow yeah it was just, yeah it was a little bit grimy smoky yeah it was, it was getting pretty bad around the 70s uh -huh. anyway so the music was the motown was coming up and uh then you had the the, the primes became the uh, supremes i think uh the temptations i forget the name the original name of the temptations i used to know uh temptations came up that's on the junior high school uh -huh. A lot of the black kids are dressing like the Temptations. You know, we're dressing like the Rolling Stones and animals. And <laughs> sure. They've got, the, got their uh, silk pants and the fine shoes and just decked out, you know. You know, everybody just was looking good in 1964, 5. Uh -huh. The Beatles hit. And uh, I was really into the animals and kinks and the Rolling Stones. And, uh, uh -huh. of course, uh, Lennon McCartney and Fab Four. Um, so that's how it started. And... Uh, I uh, got a guitar right after about a year after they were on Ed Sullivan, all that stuff happened. The Brit Oh, okay. So that kind of inspired you to want to yeah, play. Yeah, I got a guitar. My brother and I got a guitar. I went for drums. Uh -huh. We walked out with guitars. <laughs> guitar because um, I think the guy said, uh, you know, you're going to have to carry all these drums around, all the drums around. And automatically I go, well, I'm just like I'm getting a guitar. Right. You always feel bad so, for the drummer and bands, especially early on. They got to set them up and they have to have like a truck. They don't have a truck. You're like I, I, screwed. I <laughs> yeah. But uh, all my friends, it was uh, probably seventh or eighth grade, eighth grade, maybe. Mm -hmm. My friends before Beatles hit, um, uh, just before, I think, I don't know. I, I went join the, the Boy Scouts. They were all in the Boy Scouts because they had a marching band and I wanted a drum. So I got oh, to bring okay. a drum home. 
That's so I cool. bought the steering wheel and I had it for a month, never brought it back. And then it, it, I, I ended up leaving and taking it back. Yeah, I took it back. But um, and uh, then I got the guitars. We got guitars. I learned I learned satisfaction, learned how to play satisfaction. Oh, okay. Yeah, on, was, on drums? Yeah, let's just learn how to do that dun, beat. Dun, dun. <laughs> You know, oh, oh and, man, uh, Charlie Watts, yeah. what an amazing drummer! He could play oh, yeah, every, yeah. every style. Really, I mean, talk about not, a legend. not super flashy, but on the beat, and uh, uh, yeah. no yeah. muss, no fuss, uh, kick snare right on the beat. Yeah, every time, yeah. and he's like a yeah. machine, and he could play, like I said, any style of music. I mean, I mean Rolling Stones anything, are kind of yeah. all over the map, and he yeah. could do it all. A few things they had a few other guys do when he wasn't around, like if they were in the studio messing around, another guy would come in, uh, uh, Earl, Pal uh, not Earl Palmer, was it Earl Palmer? A couple other drummers. So the, oh, one, I didn't realize that. One of the producers played um, the intro to uh, Sympathy for the Devil, I think it was. Oh, uh, really? That's um, interesting. I, I had no idea. Jimmy, that. Jimmy, Jimmy uh, got him missing his last name right now. Oh, good. I'll look it up. I'm curious. Well, there's, a, there's a mismatch, but he, he mainly was a guy. He was a right, guy. right. Yeah. Sure. Wow. You know, when you're in the studio sometimes and everybody's kind of hanging out and someone's somewhere else, your bass player is two hours away or an hour away. Or, <laughs> right. Hey, man, who's around? You know, yeah, who can, can play bass? Something. Can you, can you hop on yeah. this real quick? <laughs> yeah. I think, um, I think Kenny Jones did the drums on, um, we, uh, 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 it's only rock and roll, but I like it. Oh, really? Ron Wood at Ron Wood's uh, castle, mansion, whatever, uh -huh. down the road from his mansion was a pub on the on the grounds. A lot of the, these mansions had pubs, like on really the, at a pub. They would go back to his house, and when they went to his basement, he's got a recording studio, and he came up with um, "We Got Your Rock and Roll," and they gave it over to uh, Jagger. They were both mm -hmm. in the studio and then Jagger gave him I Could Feel the Fire, which came out on Ron Wood's album. And um, and Kenny Jones was there. So Kenny Jones plays drums on, on I Can Feel the Fire. Oh, I don't wow. think they switched. I don't think uh, I'm pretty 100 percent sure that uh, Charlie didn't redo the drums, but he may have. That's interesting. I, I'm not what, sure. what, that is crazy. Yeah. Well, what, he, so when did you switch over to guitar? You had the drums and when, well, when you said drums after you saw the Beatles? Yeah, 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 after you saw the the yeah, Beatles the on L. Sullivan. Well, I, yeah. Um, before I got a guitar, we would always imitate. We would take uh, plot, <laughs> three quarter inch plywood and cut out guitars and make oh, that's cool. Them. Yeah, and uh, and play in the basement to the songs, you know, King songs, Beatles songs, mm -hmm. and uh, other how, little girls would come over. <laughs> how quickly did you start and, writing your own songs? Or uh, started joining a band or? Well, with... you always. When you're first trying, it's a little bit um, hazy because you're not sure what you're supposed to be doing. And you're trying to write, you're trying to write, you're mm -hmm. trying to write, oh, wow, you write, and it doesn't come out very good because you're trying really hard to make it something that is, you know, it's not, mm -hmm. um, it's not like now when I, something comes up, it's just like, it's kind of like um, inspired mm -hmm. and um, things come about, come, things just come out of uh, the jamming. Things coming out, I'll record it and then I'll, I'll play over it and uh, I'll get little parts, little guitar parts, or I'll get melodies or I'll take a walk or ride or bike ride. And I'll, I used to have the cassette player, but um, now the, the, my iPhone, I'll take that out and I'll, I'll play the basic track of the, of the groove that I have, the mm -hmm. chords, all the chords, and I'll just start working on uh, melodies and lyrics mm -hmm. out when I'm doing things and it's become a uh, easier, more let you let up is what you do. You let up on yourself mm -hmm. and, and they start coming out. Songs start coming out. I collect titles. I'll collect lyrics, bags and bags of lyrics and on my phone. And and then, yeah, when, when, yeah. And then there's so keep much them for save. Yeah. Whenever you might need them or you get inspired by something, you can go yeah, back and pull yeah, it. I'll, I'll just say I'll, I'll be uh, flying or uh, flying somewhere or uh, out to lunch or in the car. And I'll look at my phone and I go, and I'm just saying, well, I'll check out some lyrics. I'll check out some lyrics or I'll check out a title. Then that'll spur it to go farther, mm -hmm. you know, take off from there. Um, but early but it, it on, I mean, with, I'm sure it's hard, right? Like to start the first band or yeah, the first, get off the groin. First, yeah, my first band, like I said, we were dragging a, a wagon around with the drums and one amp. And, you know, we're all plugging into one amp. Like back then, <laughs> that's what it was. That's you know, awesome. Um, 
the first band I had, uh, we played my elementary elementary school. I was probably, God, uh, I just got the guitar. So it was probably like 13 or 14. And uh, we played a lunchtime break. And um, we learned uh, House of the Rising Sun and uh, I Feel Good, I think. And we had a singer, the singer, we were, we were 13 or 14. And the singer was like 16 or something. He seemed like way older. He seemed mm -hmm. like, yeah, but he could sing real good soul. He could, so that was one time. I mean, we rehearsed for about a week and then we played that and that was it. But the thing about it was, was my brother's records, the Buddy Hollies, the Elvis, mm -hmm. the Elvary Brothers, and then all the, the, um, the, um, it was doo-wop, but it was, it was just like the, um, it was doo up, but it wasn't, uh, uh, it was more the black, black, uh, ju uh, mm -hmm. uh, rhythm and blues stuff they mm -hmm. were listening to. It was the stuff that blue doo up guys were listening to, you know, uh, the Italian cats. That's why they call it that. They'd sing in the alleyways. But, um, so, uh, I would listen to those records and that was all that stuff happened. And then you had that lull between when Elvis went in the army which pretty much killed the vibe for rock and roll Elvis. But, um, uh, and then you had the surf music and all, all the bossa nova music was happening. They, they tried to get rid of, pretty much putting Elvis in the army was an attempt to calm down all this wild rock and roll. Oh, and, weird. I didn't know that. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, they, I mean, it makes that, sense, right? It, it does. Yeah, he, was dra he was draftable, but he, right. went to, he went to Germany and he sat in a, in a, what was it, a bedroom <laughs> house or a, yeah, um, yeah. luxury <laughs> living. <laughs> Pretty much they wanted to squash. Yeah, there was a big Rock deal. Rock and roll. That's went after uh, disc jockeys for payola. And they uh -huh. started clamping down, you know. They didn't like the fact that uh, blacks and whites were uh, were coming together at rock and roll shows. The Beatles wouldn't do a show. Wouldn't do a they wouldn't play a place that was segregated. They mm -hmm. wouldn't play anywhere that's segregated. Oh, I Elvis. didn't realize that either. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah they, they protested. Yeah. Uh, they I mean, it makes, that makes sense too. It sounds like something they would do. Yeah, they play down south. The, uh, groups would play down south and well, all over pretty much. It was everywhere, but um, really uh, raw nerves in, in the south. But mm -hmm. um, uh, whites would be downstairs. Blacks, black, black folks would be upstairs. And uh, it just started, you know, little Richard and everybody started bringing everybody together. Down, wow. And that's a big power, you know, thing that you can't control, that some people can't control. Mm -hmm. so, wow. Anyway, wow. yeah. And then Motown starts happening and that's built oh, in a certain way that it appeals to all, everybody. Everybody, you know? right. But, yeah, yeah. He, yeah, Barry Gordy was a genius at that, bringing people together to like that, a, a, a form of music and mm -hmm. a, a strong... Uh, strong rootsy music and um and i kept i heard that i'm hearing motown stuff i'm hearing motown our radio station in detroit would play motown they play james brown they play um otis redding and all that stuff and uh uh then you get uh, roy orbison and then the rolling stones would come in and you had beatles kinks and uh all those groups and uh, it really um when the english british invasion happened a lot of groups were shunned to the side because it was like kind of the sound was kind of like the sound wasn't fresh in a way, mm -hmm. uh, quote unquote fresh. I don't subscribe to that, but um, <laughs> you know, the, the older, the, uh, the generations were changing. Sure. The 14 year olds are coming up, but anyway, so that means that's what I had. I had this backlog of all that stuff from that era with my brothers and then the radio in Detroit. And uh, then you had all the underground groups coming out, the groups, uh, teen clubs and tons of groups in Detroit learning learning all those songs and uh the Pratt rock songs the motown songs and it started changing into a rock and roll scene there was a uh -huh. rock and roll scene in the motown scene and you had the pack which became grand funk and you had uh the chosen few which became those guys became uh some i think i can't remember all the names it became right. bob, Seger, bob Seger group and uh the uh i can't think of iggy pop's name the iggy and the Gu iguanas it was the iguanas yeah iguanas yeah, yeah and um he, he was in the apostles or something like that he played drums i think it was the apostles and um yeah so all these scene clubs started happening and then then the uh the ballroom scene started happening with the psychedelic area era with the fillmore and 
the Grandy Ballroom, and mm -hmm. the uh, oh God, I'm forgetting the names. Uh, the Aragon Ballroom, and uh, I think was in Chicago, and then in Denver it was uh, the Electric something. I can't remember the name of it, but um, yeah, ballrooms, all all old oh, 1940s ballrooms that the big bands played. All the rock bands were playing those now, so that's what happened. And uh, so there's a big, wide, long range of music that I grew up with, and uh, wow. it influenced me, you know, especially the Who, the Who, uh, Kinks, Animals uh -huh. was like my favorite, the, the favorite, three. favorite. Okay. Yeah, I still have that Kinks thing in me. Uh, that <laughs> that you really got me till the end of the day, uh, and the Animals, raw, bluesy kind of thing, and mm -hmm. Yardbirds. That's what did it. If you look at it. The MC5, which was like a outgrowth of like the Who meets the Yardbirds. Yeah. With a little bit, yeah, with the avant gardeness of jazz, where they would go off into these long jams where there would be noise and feedback jams. You know, they'd just be, just be, the song would come down and they'd, they'd stretch it out for, you know, minutes. Yeah. Groups were like getting very exp experimental with any pop on yeah. stage, you know, doing crazy things on stage. His Listen. whole show, his whole show is an art form, you know. Uh huh. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't the first uh, romantic show with MC5. It was a re uh, a re um, a re upped version of the MC5 in 1976. The lead singer and I think the drummer were in it of the original MC5. And my friend, who I played in high school with, Robert Gillespie, he he they formed uh, reformed, and they asked us. Romantics had just gotten together in 1976. Okay. Um, so prior to the romantics getting together, were you were in a band prior to that, or like were yeah, you, you I was in a lot school of or playing. just a lot of stuff before the that band came together? Yeah, probably. I got out of high school and we were playing in my Jimmy Jimmy the romantics drummer. We were playing mm -hmm. in his mom's basement with with Robert Gillespie, the guitar player who was going to do the MC Five. Uh, good, really good player. He's sixteen years old, could play like Clapton, you know, when he was young. Wow. He was really good. Yeah, and um, and. Uh, it was three of us. We just stayed. In the, we were in the basement, just playing every day after school. And when we graduated, we ended up getting a keyboard player with a Hammond organ. But uh, we graduated. We moved into a, sh a lot of bands in Detroit. Would get these storefronts. There would be old uh, hairdresser salons or old tool shops or old, and they were like in the middle of the neighborhood down a big street. And uh, fifty bucks, seventy bucks, ninety bucks. You get in this shut in this uh, storefront, and you. Uh, smear it with foam or or or, or uh, egg cartons, egg cartons, yeah, there's any sort clothes. of uh, yeah, soundproofing, yeah, because we we had stacks of marshals, we had marshal stacks, and <laughs> which yeah, is crazy because uh, those are pretty much obsolete when it comes to touring now, right? Well, I see bands on with half stacks. I was surprised right. the show. I went to a, a DJ show. It was outdoor DJ show and uh, DJ Action Slacks and. Uh, she uh, plays uh, 50s and 60s uh, cool cool music, stuff okay. you don't hear, real, avant real stuff that you don't hear too much. And I went inside, these bands were going to play, and uh, I'm used to like Ramon setting up and Marshalls, yeah. and that's gone away now. There's all little amps. Play a little combo Guys, amps, right? Half <laughs> there's a little club, and they're, they've got half sack Marshalls and, and high watts. And uh, I'm going, are they really going to use them? I, I couldn't believe it. it was, <laughs> so it's kind of a thing. I think it's kind of a thing. It's coming back. Yeah, it's kind that's of nice to know. That's good to know. Yeah, and I like it. Yeah, that's like, cool. Yeah, because we would rehearse when I was out of high school. We were rehearsing. Um, the guitar player had a sack, full stack of Marshalls. I had uh, four fifteens and two Sun Coliseum heads, just like and we still had when I was, I was playing bass. I switched. Yeah, yeah, you started playing bass right with Romantics too, yeah, weren't you playing bass guitar. in the beginning? I learned guitar um, in '66. I. I uh, I really got into it. I was just banging around before that. And okay. Six, five, six, uh, that summer, one of those summers, I went home after school, got out uh, for the summer, and I learned to play play songs, to play, actually play. That summer, in three months, I taught myself all the stuff I needed to know. Oh, to learn wow. Songs. Yeah, to learn, to learn uh, Dylan, to learn Rolling Stones, to learn um, the 13th Floor Elevators, to Electric Prunes. The blues, the goos, all that stuff, and um, and then I then the MC5 uh, looking at you single came out, and that was a big like a big electrification of yourself. You know, you, wow, mm -hmm. this stuff's wild, 
is all feedback and and uh, orchestrated noise. You know, it's mm -hmm. the, the the new rock and roll. Grand yeah. Funk, MC Five, the Scott Richard case, uh, Bob Seger. Uh, well, later Alice Cooper came back into town in the seven in sixty nine, but in sixty five up to sixty nine, there was all these young bands playing everywhere. It, uh, Savage Grace came up, uh, a, a really great band. If you ever get a chance, look up Savage Grace. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the name SR sounds familiar. I, I want to say I've heard of them. SRC Scott Richard mm -hmm. Case, great group. Um, Singer Scott Richard was big friends with Iggy. Um, uh, God, I'm missing so many groups. The Frost, sure. You, you, Detroit, yeah. just go on and look. Yeah, they're going nuts, right? Detroit mid '60s bands. Yeah, it was a lot of groups. That, those are groups that I learned off of. The attitude, the energy mm -hmm. on stage, the way to attack. You know, uh, attack a guitar. Um, guitar players in Detroit didn't tend to use effects. You still see it. We don't use a lot of pedals. We just turn the amp up and turn the guitar down on rhythms. You know, it's really just getting the raw sound. You might see a pedal nowadays once in a while, but back then- Not a whole lot, right. Uh, you know, the guy down the street was uh, Fast Eddie who worked on all the amplifiers and um, people would come in. My speakers are blowing the street, uh, are these Marshall cabinets and he just tell them you got to turn down, you know, they're turning all the way up. So. <laughs> yeah. so there were 25 watt speakers. And uh, so people start start putting in thirty five. You know they boosted it up a little better. Ah, boosted it up. Sure. Anyway, uh, so seventy seven yeah, so, was the first uh, romantic show. Well, how you said the oh, band yeah. started pretty quickly before that. Well, that was it. I got off the subject, but Robert and uh, Rob Tyner and the drummer uh, were forming reforming uh, the MC five, and we were together for about a month. And our thing was, I had seen, uh, no, the Flaming Gro Groovies record came out and we loved it. I mean, it was, it was, I, uh, I brought it over to the drummer, Jimmy. I go, look, we can do this. We could write these songs. These are the songs uh, we could write. We had gone to New York. We played CBGBs with a little group. Mm -hmm. and we came home and the group broke up. So we were taking time off. We hadn't taken time off for a few months for a long time. We were always jamming, always playing, always writing. In those in those storefronts and so uh uh i saw this thing for the flame groovies i saw the new musical express with uh all the bands coming out of london and the jam the jam really stuck, stuck out because of the mm -hmm. look and the and the attitude the who attitude mm -hmm. and that was right up my alley for guitar but i was playing bass at the time i, I learned guitar and uh so when the romantic started i was going to play bass and there were no guitar players in Detroit. They were so stuck. Well, not stuck. They were so deep in their uh, in the Led Zeppelins and the uh, which we grew up on and we played when we were kids. That's what we learned from early Led Zeppelin and all the MC5 stuff. And uh, but that stuff got played out. Like the songs were too long. The the shows. Uh, uh, anyway, let me back up. Uh, it, there was overindulgent, overindulgence in the music. The same songs will get played on the radio. That's why the punk and new wave scene happened. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, we we I, we saw this thing. Uh, I saw this thing, the jam and the flame of groovies. I brought it over to Jibby. And I told him we could do this. And um, I had met Wally a couple of years before uh, at a recording session uh, someone was having, and uh, and uh, then uh, I heard he was playing somewhere and. Um, I went and saw him play. We had gone through the, the whole ups and downs of trying to get a lead singer. It was like you had to have a lead singer that was like Rod Stewart or uh, or, or Mitch Ryder or, or Mick Jagger. And then that all changed when the New York Dials came out and Lou Reed and Ramones. It was like, wow, I can do this. It was a DIY, mm -hmm. you know, why don't I do it? So everyone started singing themselves. But uh, so I checked out Wally. He sounded pretty good. And Got him together. He came over. We rehearsed at that point the beginnings of the Romantics. And um, Rob Tyner came over with Robert. They came over to our studio and asked us if we wanted to open their show. They were going to have uh, TVs, TV, TV, uh, um, folks from TV coming over and radio. And wow. uh, yeah, and the news press and all that. They were doing it. It's called a, uh, what do you call it? A uh, Like a showcase? Yeah, sure, exactly. Showcase. Uh-huh. And um, so they came over, they liked, they liked 
what they saw we were we had these pop songs really like kind of like king's beatles things and it was like really different from what they were doing they were doing like kind of like uh, along the lines of a 70s, kind of like uh, long hair, bell bottom still. And we're, we see our skinny tight pants and our <laughs> skinny coats, tight right. coats and skinny ties and all that kind of thing. And um, they asked us to play. We, uh, we got the gig. Uh, we rehearsed uh, all our new songs. We had songs with really good choruses that people could sing, really short three minute songs. And uh, we came out, we played, well, we got these orange suits. We found these orange suits in uh, the Salvation Army. <laughs> hey, Jimmy, what's the Salvation Army? And there were two suits in the window and they were orange, like uh, iridescent, like greaser, uh, like um, like 60s, 19, early 60s suits. They were kind of baggy though, we took them in. And um, we, we went to the rack and there were like a row of suits, orange. It, it was like some wedding or something, some yeah, like the groomsmen or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they all so return the same, the same day find the smallest ones you can so we pulled out four small ones and took them and had them altered and uh so there's photos of us with these orange suits but uh we came out we played we moved around the stage we, we were just like a raw new wave punk band and uh with really melodic songs really good raw songs and uh and we got called back we got asked back uh two weeks later and uh we, we mink deville was playing uh material from new york and um it's, it just took off right from there uh, we got wow. a good press the djs all liked it we were trying to get our record a 45 out that week that we played but it didn't come out till the two weeks later and we had that record at the next show mm -hmm. uh, all the radio people came out they started playing that single um they at that time radio wasn't really ready for any of the new wave ramones were, weren't getting played blondie wasn't getting played None of the none of the punk fans were getting played on radio. It was all classic rock, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Kansas, Queen, uh, Styx, um, Led Zeppelin. Every twenty minutes, the same thing. Yeah, 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 sure. So, and we we're digging our, into our records, back into our records, finding all old songs and stuff, and uh, learning to write like the guys we grew up with and grew up on. Anyway, so it took off, and the third show, we were asked to play our managers got us a show at uh, the Silverdome, Pontiac Silverdome, where the, where the Detroit Lions played. And, uh, <laughs> oh, wow. Your third years. show? You're playing a stadium? So, yeah. We went from a little club. <laughs> yeah. Who'd and, you play uh, with at the stadium? It was a stadium. And we played, we went on like at 7, 7.30 or something. So there wasn't, it wasn't full, but there were 7,000 people in front of us that were coming out early. The biggest crowd we ever had. And Who, uh, who are you opening for? Uh, Jay Giles, Steve Miller, and um, uh, Peter Frampton. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. And Romantics opening. Yeah, and, uh, that's quite the bill. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And uh, it went over. We didn't get boot booed off, which could happen. That's in nice, Detroit. yeah. Nothing was thrown at us. And uh, Solid, solid good show. <laughs> 40 set, good 40 minute set. Got on, got off, and wahoo. <laughs> wow. You know, you, so it, it took off from there and we hit the road and just uh, kept going for three years and got signed to them for records. Wow. Yeah. Did you have uh, What I Like About You out yet? Was that the uh, single? No. We, no, oh, no so that wasn't even out yet. No, no. We were just all original songs that really, uh, there's there's a tape of some of the original songs of, of the set that hasn't been released. It's a couple songs that I'd, I'd say maybe three of the songs that we played made it to the first album that we played on the third show i think uh three or four songs we made the first record and then okay. the rest were new songs but uh um what i like about you wasn't written till like the second year of the band i think the second okay. or third year of the band. so you had gotten signed from what that for those first early shows and then yeah you we put kept out... going to new york we were in new york playing all the time all the clubs we, and then we the first record came out what a couple of years later yeah, uh, no, it, uh, we got signed uh, 79 and we, the record came out in 80. Okay. 1980. The album, first album came out. Okay, yeah. So, okay, so that, that well, what I like about you is on the first record, right? So yeah, nice and, and, and what okay. I like about was we, we formed in 76. Oh, um, got you. And then, okay. We, played, we wrote probably 78, was 70, late 77 or 78, what I like about you was written. Okay. Yeah, we and, went on the road. I think we played it 
that tour of 78, a big wow. snowstorm. We drove to Boston. It was a big snowstorm, like two feet of snow. We're all the way halfway. We're all the way there, past New York. And then snow starts coming in when you're on the, the, the turnpike, uh, the, the uh, parkway. And that uh, goes from uh, Rhode Island all the way into Boston. And uh, through Connecticut, and that snow starts snowing. And it's, it ends up two feet of snow. And we got, got into Boston. They told us to turn around and go back. But we went, we drove like we're going out the outdoor and then we turned around and went in. <laughs> we went in the outdoor. <laughs> took off. Into the outdoor. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we went to the hotel and uh, Kenmore Square right behind uh, Boston Red Sox at Fenway Park uh -huh. um, was the Rats Keller, the old club where all the bands played from the 60s. And, and then behind that was the uh, Boston Tea Party where all the, Yard yeah. played. Whoa. Yeah. And and we were we were playing the Rat Skeller. Um we stayed at the Holiday Inn or no the Howard Johnson's. There's no Howard Johnson anymore, Howard Johnson Hotel. Oh, and, I remember uh, the Howard Johnson Hotel. That's not a, I didn't think about that. Yeah, I don't see that anymore. Yeah, it, was <laughs> it's just not, it doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, hotel in <laughs> yeah, the orange, orange and blue. blue. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we stayed there every time. And That's our crew, funny. our crew would always pull the fire alarm. <laughs> at two o'clock in the morning oh, no, I, I don't know if that happened but i think that's what happened but uh that's funny road crew messing with us but uh but what you anyway, came out so the gate like there. hot right i mean with with what i like about you this the song charted right away right um not then that we weren't signed yet we, we, oh we, okay we you weren't signed we, still we hadn't recorded it yet and uh we didn't record it till uh 80 1980 okay yeah and then it charted it was the third song released mm -hmm. uh, the first on the first album. First album was, uh, I think it was When I Look in Your Eyes uh, and Charles Carey and then What I Like About You. Mm -hmm. And they all hit the middle of the charts. Uh, I think uh, 47, if I'm not mistaken, number 47 was What I Like About You. Wow. Um, the song me and Jimmy came up with at our rehearsal studio. Um, I, was, I, was, I was always late getting to rehearsal, of course, 20 minutes late. <laughs> Uh, I lived about, uh, I lived, uh, we rehearsed around Seven Mile Road, and then I lived, my parents lived around 12 or 13, 13 Mile Road. Mm -hmm. They had the mile roads because when they built cars, they didn't have odometers. So on, May, on, on, on Highway 1, which is Woodward, they had mile roads so that when they drove the cars, they could tell how far they went. Uh, so that it goes out to like 20, 23 mile, 26 mile road, I think. When they went to Pontiac, Michigan, so that's why we had mile roads. Anyway, uh, we re we rehearsed around uh, down in Detroit, and uh, I got there early because my mom my mom dropped me off. My car broke down, and uh, it was uh, Jimmy was just there, and um, we had our, our storefront. It was all blacked out. He has the lights all on. He has the light. He would have the lights perfect over his drums for his hair, and <laughs> so he looked like a stage, you know. Right, of course. Uh, and we rehearsed like it was a show. And um, so uh, I, I told him I, I picked up this idea. I came up with this idea that, that day, brought it in and I told him, come on, let's check this out. And automatically he was like singing and playing, right? Like coming up with a jibber jabber of lyrics. Right. And, wow. uh, and I didn't have the intro part. I uh -huh. had the chords. And um, so it was just me and him just jamming on it. And we played it four or five times. and. Those guys showed up a uh, half hour later and, uh, hey, check this out. Here's how you play this. And uh, I started to come up with an intro. And um, uh, I think I screamed, screamed out, uh-huh, or something somewhere. And Jimmy screamed that out. And we, something we wanted us back and forth. And then the haze. I, I, I think I shouted the haze in hey. there. <laughs> from, from the Yardbirds over under Sideways Down. You know, they've got that in, in that song. And uh -huh. we tried Hayes in um in uh Latin Loopy Lou. Anyway, a number of songs had Hayes, but right, right now right. a lot too. Anyway, so uh then we're on the road for three years and we did the first album and it came out on the first album and it went to 47 and it dropped off the charts and the album was out not even a year, maybe it was like uh till August or late late in that year, and then the management told us we got to get back in the studio for the next record. Oh, which was crazy we had just yeah. toured, we just toured us 
Oh, uh, maybe once or twice, but um, we were out with Cheap Trick. Uh, we did a few shows with ZZ Top down in Texas at, in El Paso. That's cool. 90 degrees. I mean, here's how, here's how, here's how dedicated or how we believed in what we we're doing. We had red leather, short hair, skinny tight, skin tight, and we're going into Texas with ZZ Top on El, El Paso on the border, and we're doing our show. <laughs> and it went over. I mean, you know, yeah. we never got booed off. Or, or, or you know we we believe we lived what we were doing right we and you guys are good obviously yeah, they they yeah. couldn't they couldn't really hate yeah um, if you, yeah if you walked out reluctantly wearing that it you, mm -hmm. you wouldn't work right 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 exactly you gotta own it yeah, well now yeah. you're at 40 what 41 years later and you redid the song for your new record i did yeah um well talk to me about that a little bit i mean everybody and their grandmother's done it and uh <laughs> Not really. Why not the original guy do it? Yeah, there's no problem with that. I mean, other people <laughs> played it, which is great, and other yeah. people have written things that sound like it. Um, and um, and I just figured, uh, 40 years, we, we're we're going to do a 40 year um, uh, uh, release of something, and it never happened. A 30, a 30 year, 35 year, 40 year, it never happened. So I just figured off um, on the 41st year instead of last year because right of course year, i figured i'll do the 41st year i like it so. so you and you got some other people together for for the remake of the song well i did it with um my drummer brad uh brad elvis played on it okay i played the bass on it i played guitar on it so i just we laid down the guitar track mm -hmm. uh him on drums me on guitar i laid one guitar down and it sat for a little bit, the, the recording sat for a little bit. And then uh, uh, I brought it back and uh, they didn't, I, I knew it had to have, I have the original high watt amps. So I uh, took, pulled the, the original high watt amps out. I played uh, the, my Rickenbacker through the high watts to get the sound. And uh, then I, I played the bass and I just followed Rich the bass part. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I got the sound like it really, really came out pretty close to the original it's a little mm -hmm. more live a little more in your face which i like and yeah. that's what we, we wanted that originally we wanted Grit it to really it live yeah we managed wanted a really live sounding album the punk scene at the time was about going in the studio laying it down twice leaving everything the way it was don't do a lot of overdubbing it, it should be raw in your face if there's a mistake there's a mistake and then put it out and uh, we were about that, but the producer kind of reined all that in and uh, and cl uh, cleaned, it say, <laughs> yeah, cleaned it up a bit, cleaned it up and juiced it up a little bit. But okay. I have to admit, I have to fix this microphone. No, go ahead. I have to admit, uh, because he did that, it, it, I think the, the band sound the the album lasts. It's mm -hmm. got lasting power because it wasn't so erratic and like raw and mistake laden and he right. really, really tightened things up he, we if there was a, a a kick drum part that might need be needed to be a little different in the bridge or the chorus we worked on that but we worked on the, the choruses the, the way the the choruses or the melodies uh would end up so they were complete that's why we got a producer that knew he was a really good uh uh musician he was a mm -hmm. great piano player a young kid uh, kind of a prodigy but uh pete Sally. And uh, he did a great job. I mean, I, I can't I can't argue with it. I wish it was a little raw and more feedback and more noise, but it wouldn't last as long, I don't think. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I was out of the band for a year, came back in. Right, which is interesting and, that you you leave the band and then you come back with yeah, the next well, biggest song, right? <laughs> yeah, well, there's a lot of turmoil in that, in that you got to do a second record. Right, think, right. I mean, you had to write a whole new record in months where the first record took three years, three, four years. And uh, so it was down to me and the band, but I had to come up with like spark, the spark. Oh, I got right. this, check this out. A lot of this. pressure. Yeah, I mean, and that created a little bit of a, I think some turmoil and uh, uh, and I was going after management about where, so where's the royalties? I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing my publishing. Not seeing, and we're getting these little disbursements, and uh, so I think managers get a little shaky there about that, and uh, 
And then I was always the guy that was going, no, man, I don't want to do that. I don't want to wear this. On the second album, you see, we're not wearing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And other guys in the band wanted to wear the same thing on the second cover. And I didn't want to repeat myself. And so I really sucked, to, you know, I'm watching the new wave and punk scene in London. And I'm not going, eh, I don't know if I want to wear the same thing again. So it's got a more, uh, the second album has a more like we worked our ass off in the studio and we're all, you know, right. laid out, burned out from working our ass in the studio. And it was National Breakout. And um, which is a really good record, a lot of good songs on there. And uh, mm -hmm. we did a tour on that record. And um, uh, I, I didn't rehearse enough. I don't think the rehearsals were enough. And uh, I was kind of jamming on solos. And so things weren't quite as good as they could have been in my part, I think. And I, I, something was happening. And uh, so I was out, fired, and came back uh, a year and a half later. They put out a record. The guys got another guy in there. And, uh, and, um, they put out a record. It didn't do squat. And um, right, they put out strictly personal and, yeah, and it flops. Was, uh, it was and a, then you come back with in heat, and you put out yeah next and, to the best big you know next biggest song that the band has ever done. Yeah, uh, <laughs> so I imagine that's pretty Nymph validating, right? The Manics run Nemphor Records, which was a custom label of Epic Portrait, which was a custom label of Columbia CBS. Uh -huh. Okay. So we were like an independent of an independent. And they told the management we had to uh, either get me back to, for songs or they're going to bring someone in to write songs after that album that they put out. So I got a call and asked if I wanted to play bass and do some guitar work and writing. And I had just put another a group together. I just put a group, really good group together in Detroit. And it was a, a singer that I still talked to, talk to, Mike Persh. He was in a band called Rhythm Core. If you look them up, they, they had a hit uh, in the 90s. Um, anyway, I decided to go on the road, hit the road again, make some more money, and then I could come back and do whatever I wanted as far as recording that the other group. But mm -hmm. uh, we stayed on the road. We were on the road. Up, uh, we released uh, 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 In Heat record, and, um, and uh, we went right on the road. We were on the road for 11 months straight. We were, we, we, uh, uh, but we never went to Europe. We never were in Europe or, or, uh, uh, the Netherlands or, uh, we never played France. We never played, we, we did, we were in Germany. I mean, we're in Germany, but we didn't play. We played, uh, I think, uh, year before, uh, uh, and he came out, we we're in Japan. I think it was a promo party or a birthday for the, the president of, uh, for the president of, um, uh, CBS mm -hmm. and Sony and um, and a lot of bands from London came. Uh, uh, public, uh, not public image. Yeah, public. No. Oh wow, Pill. Uh, she, she, um, what you call it? Uh, this guy from the jam, the jam. What's the group he had on later? Um, uh, I can't think of it. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, uh, Paul Weller's group. After Paul Weller, uh, uh, there was a bunch of groups that came up from London, Austra Australia, brought uh, in excess. We. We hung out with in excess all those guys and um anyway we're in japan and we came back that one tour and uh we we never hit uh europe and we put to this day uh, uh it's really a downfall because there's so many shows in the fall spring and fall so many uh, uh festivals of that that we miss out on because of it um the style yeah. council that's what it was. Oh, council, exactly. <laughs> I had to figure it out because it was bugging me too. Yeah, I can't. Well, I'm trying to think grass. I can't. Oh, thank you, Google. <laughs> wow. Style council. And, yeah. Uh, and uh, in excess, we played with and a bunch of other groups. Anyway, uh, so uh, what happened? Uh, during the time I was off, mm -hmm. when, when the music went from uh, this new way punk thing to this new romantic thing, new romance, they call it new romantics, uh, <laughs> coincidentally. Um, uh, it was uh, basically, it was bands sounding and looking like Roxy Music, pretty much Roxy Music and Eno and the avant-garde stuff that was coming out in the uh -huh. 80s, 70s and 80s of, uh, from England, uh, the, glitter, the glitter scene. And um, so you had, so you had uh, Duran Duran, Spandau Ballet, uh, um, who else? Uh, Adam Ant wasn't out yet, I don't think. It was just coming out. But all these groups that were, it was more of a lush production. Production got more uh, uh, glossy, more, uh -huh. more produced. 
So when I came back to the band, I had been listening to all these XTCs, Elvis Costello, uh, Squeeze. Mm -hmm. I was loving that stuff. And so, and Nick Lowe was a big, big, I was a big fan of Nick Lowe and all that stuff, the rock pile and all that. And um, uh, the whole Elvis Costello scene thing. Uh, um, and uh, uh, what happened after that? Um, so when we got the studio for Into Heat, it became more produced record. And that's how uh, Talking to Your Sleep came oh, out was a, base, yeah. a baseline that I had when we were jamming way back before we recorded the record. And uh, we were in the studio, we doing pre-production for the record. And we had like, probably had like 15 to 18 songs. We narrowed it down to 11 songs. Um, and I just had this jam with Jimmy, uh, uh, it became talking to your sleep. It was just a ba da dum, ba da dum, ba da dum, ba da dum, and we just jammed on it. It was just a jam, no no lyrics or nothing, and uh, it was like a fun jam. And um, we got in the studio. We finished the record at Criteria. Uh, eleven songs, I think it was eleven songs, ten or eleven songs, and. Oh, that was great. The producer comes on and says, well, we need one more song. And um, we didn't know we didn't have we didn't know what we we're gonna do. Uh, so it came down to Mike, what about that tune that you had on bass? And it wasn't even a song yet. And I go, Well, I got the bass part. Um, and so Jimmy plays the part and we start messing with it, and the song starts taking a shape. Um, so when we got that shape, the first uh verse shape, um we went to the control room, brought a keyboard, what the word is in there. And uh, Pete was a really great piano player. And so me, Jimmy and uh, Pete around the piano, the other guys were in the room. And uh, and we're coming up with a turnaround and Pete's really good with that. I could throw a chord out there. I could tell him what about, because I knew what would work with certain things from guitar. I could go, sure. what about, you know, I'd be on guitar. And uh, he'd take it and he'd go, okay. And then he'd switch it this way. So we ended up, we all came up with uh, Talking Your Sleep after after the bass, bass part. So that was the last song that got added to the record? That was the last song that was added wow. to the record. Wow, that is insane. Just yeah. think about what if he wouldn't have said, hey, well, we need one more one <laughs> yeah. more." Song. Well, what if you, yeah. Or what if they didn't call me back? <laughs> oh, right. No, yeah, then they wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> that was their best decision ever, you know what I mean? <laughs> he kept the band going until still, right? Still So active. what do I like about you, me and Jimmy? And yeah, to then talking to your sleep. I mean, that's incredible. I should have wrote more songs with Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you well, have we did, we a did. solo we worked, record, right? Uh, we worked, we were, he would, uh, he was like an arranger guy. Like, you know, mm -hmm. we, uh, where if a part was too long, he'd say, oh, you should shorten that part or that kind of thing. We came up with the music, he would arrange it. He, was, he wasn't about the music, but. He could, he knew yeah. how to structure it or yeah, arrange yeah, the song. It, it, we, yeah, we'd allow, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. And then, so are you, you're still obviously writing and yeah, you have a, you have a solo always, record coming yeah. out. You not, not only are uh, obviously putting this reimagined version of the romantic song, but you have a new, a bunch of new songs on yeah, there. Yeah, well, the as the pandemic happened, um, well, all through the all through two thousand five, six, seven, eight, the last half of two uh, thousands, um, uh, I had been writing. It felt good to. Uh, I wrote a few things that uh, came out on my own lyrics and everything, mm -hmm. and I, I I fed it to the band on this record 60, 60, 49. Uh huh. And. Uh, so I was getting really like going, wow, here's stuff that I would like to sing. Here's stuff that I would like to do myself. So I was hoarding some things. And um, and then these are the things that came out. Uh, um, you know, uh, it's a list I got. It started with uh, 67 Riot was one of the early, early ones I had. Um, uh, uh, Carrie Got Married came from uh, Brad Elvis, the drummer, his wife came up in her head on the way home from a show when we played in Detroit they drove back to Chicago and they came up with this idea without without a piano without a guitar just singing it and she I recorded it with them as like a uh, we were doing a little re recording project and I recorded it with them and then um, I don't know who's going to sing it Would you, uh, I, didn't, I didn't sing it and then when I was doing my project I ended up singing it um, so I had this, all these uh, uh, tunes I was finishing up and uh, Not My Business came out, My Bad Pretty, 
Dark Side of Your Love, Carrie Got Married was the one she wrote. Mm -hmm. And I gave all my guitar, little guitar uh, tags on it, if you listen to it. Um, so the first one was 67 Riot, uh, recorded that in bits and pieces and in my little studio down the road and um, in Portland and uh, the rest of the stuff I was recording in Portland or in Chicago with uh, mm -hmm. Brad's guy, uh, Mike Hagler. And I'd go in, we'd be on the road somewhere and I'd, when I'm crossing the United States, I'd stop off in Chicago, stay with Brad at his house and uh, we'd run in the studio and I'd lay down two songs, backtracks and then go back on the road or go home. And so I took all these ideas and uh, uh, when, it, when in the last three years and really finalized them and sent the tapes. I had met Chuck Alcasian at Pearl Sound in Detroit. I met him somewhere uh, at award show or something. And, uh, and, uh, and he said, send me the tapes, send me the songs. I, they had been uh, mixed, but he got them and then took them to a whole other level. And I go, I gotta release these things. They're great, they're sounding good. Uh, so I, I would, I had been telling him I'd like to get, I, I really love Wayne Kramer. He's my favorite guitar player, Wayne Kramer and Fred Smith from uh, the MC5. Mm -hmm. And, um, and he goes, call him up, call him up. And I go, no, I can't call him. I can't call him. I, I'm, you know, I'm, he's like on a pedestal, you know, uh, a guy I really love how to play, love how he played. And, uh, and I eventually called, I relented and I called him and, um, and uh, he said, send the song out and he loved the song. And uh, he, he, I told him, just go nuts and do what you do with the MC5 and, or whatever you do now. And uh, he played on it. So I released a version with him and it's, came, awesome. out, it's coming out on the album. Yeah. Uh, next month it comes out in September. Yeah, September 10th. October, that looks like. uh, yeah. September. No, no. October. It's, now it's October. It got moved one month, month high. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, it's October 10th. And uh, that's my wife's birthday. So I'll let her know. Yeah. My wife's <laughs> uh, October 11th. Oh really? How crazy! <laughs> so, yeah, and uh, yeah. So uh, Chuck did an incredible god got a uh, job. Uh, great guy, and uh, we love him. And um, he's in Pearl Sound uh, out in um, Detroit area, and um, and he worked with Chris Cornell and all these people. And yeah, he, I saw he, that. It's he, amazing. He mixes on singles or singles. Eminem. <laughs> So that's he could take cool. a song and just like make it sound really good. That's incredible. And anyway, so these all came out. I put what I like about you out, and uh, you'll get the vinyl. Will come out in November, I think. Awesome. We're talking November. I love it. I, yeah, yeah. I'm definitely gonna give myself the vinyl. I'm huge, yeah, huge, yeah, yeah huge fan yeah, of it. Sure. So awesome, man. Well, thank you so much, Mike, for telling me all this. I mean, this well, is Adam. Incredible. Thank you very much for having me. And you've um, been awesome. I love. I yeah. This I learned so much from you. I really appreciate you. it. And I I, I kind of get all these different ideas coming at once. They kind of mishmash and no, I love each other. But it's um, beautiful. Yeah, the word I, comes I have, out. I enjoy it. I have one more question for you before I let you go, though. I want to know yeah. if, if do you have any advice for aspiring artists. Oh wow. Well, um, well. If you can't write on your own, work with somebody and kind of bounce off ideas, but it's about writing and protecting your songs and uh, copywriting them. And uh, uh, if you get management, get your own accountant. Not, don't use the, the manager's accountant and uh, get your own attorney, read contracts and that. But uh, no, really just, we just jammed all the time in high school. Uh, we were always about writing songs. We were never about being a cover band and playing other people's songs. We did that. We did that in our own uh, font for our own fun, but there was only like one one year, one one fall fall time uh, fall season. We uh, put together a set. It had Rolling Stones, cool Rolling Stones song, cool Queen songs. Uh, we were like eight, I was like 18, 20 years old. I don't know. Uh, and we did one set that was cool and a set of our originals. We had a set of originals, a set of covers. We did Queen, Roxy music. Uh, it was really cool, actually. Uh, Rolling Stones, and that's the only time we did covers. We always were in the studio writing. We we're always in our little storefront, um, which would be someone's bedroom now, I guess. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, you know, I remember going to the studio on Christmas Day, Christmas Eve, building building bass cabinets when I was a bass player, becoming. And um, anyway, uh, yeah, just keep at it. I mean, I played bass for all those years and no guy, none of the guys in Detroit wanted to play the simple straight ahead rock and roll that we were coming up with. So uh, it was like, oh, I'm going to have to do it. So I jumped into it. So 
I love it. Keep at it and uh, keep your dream alive, I guess, is what, what you got to do. And, uh, um, and just open your mind up for the, let the songs happen and come out. Bring it back, we're good. 